Welcome to the 50th office hour, and it is the last of China X 1.0, so the last for now. And so I'm here with Peter to sum up everything we know, or well, at least to comment on really your this, submissions. Really, this, this past week, this uh, past because week. we still have one more final closing thing. That we do. Appear. We do. That's true. We do. We wanted to let you know that for the final mini course, final assessment for part 10, we have until Monday, March 16th to finish it for an honor code or for a verified certificate track. Certificates will be issued on March 19th. A reminder, updates to certificates and scores, the final reissue date will be March 26th, and we'll be sending out a survey to you with this week's email asking for your comments and advice on the course as we move to developing China X 2.0. We've been asking, you've been asking, uh, how long we will keep everything up. And Bill and I have decided that we will keep all the modules up, at least until June. Uh, right. But we'll, we'll let you know. Summer we'll vacation, let you know we will let you know at that time. In advance. Yeah. One thing that has been taken down between last week and this is uh, that very popular film, Under the Dome. Oh, yes. Right. It was very popularly, widely viewed, huh? hundreds of millions of viewers, right. praised by the Minister of the Environment, our friend Chen Jining. But as of, I guess, Friday or Saturday, uh, it seems to have disappeared. Well, so there we promise not to disappear. And in fact, you know, one of the things we could say is that not one single, well, not one single module of China X has been censored in China. That's true. Now, we have some questions, Bill, from uh, from learners yes. for this week. Yes, we do. So this course about Greater China included Hong Kong, but you didn't talk about Hong Kong. We didn't talk enough about Hong Kong. You, so not we, me, we. Yeah, you. yeah, yeah. yeah you, but it's true. We didn't talk So enough. tell us something about Hong Kong. Well, <laughs> <laughs> now, it's true that in the next version of this, we will need to have a much okay. more detailed discussion of Hong Kong. We really focused more in the greater China picture on the relationship between Taiwan and the mainland okay. and not on Hong Kong's retrocession. For those who don't know, Hong Kong is, of course, a special administrative region of the People's Republic of China, uh, guaranteed a high degree of autonomy for 50 years after 1997. And this we have discussed in office hour, the, the promise in the basic law uh, to move toward a uh, more representative structure than left behind by the British, and the promise made by the People's Republic of uh, universal suffrage for the election of the chief executive how that chief executive is in fact elected is at the heart of the political crisis in Hong Kong over the, over the last year. Well, one of the things that surprised me about Hong Kong is that I'd assumed that under the British they had some sort of democratic government, but they didn't. Why would you have assumed that? I, it was a colony. It was a colony and it was treated as a colony. Right. It had a very good legal system, but it was never. Never, uh, never a democracy. Never, you know, if I were to sum up the challenges that Hong Kong faces, it's worth saying it has the problem of an partially reformed polity. It has a chief executive who has authority, but because he isn't really elected, not a great deal of legitimacy. Mm -hmm. You have mm -hmm. a body of legislature, the Legislative Council, the uh, LegCo, uh, which it has legitimacy because it's elected, but actually very little authority except to stop things. Mm. And third, you have, separate from both of these, a very good and professional civil service. It's a very complex polity. Good. So 2.0, uh, when 2 we have the new structure, the cluster structure, we'll get to that. Then. We'll get okay. to that. Other Either, questions? Let's move on. Um, how about uh, the ideological tightening in educational institutions that seems to be going on in China now? Well, we've talked a lot about it in the last module. Uh, it seems to be getting tighter and tighter and mm -hmm. tighter. Mm -hmm you would be teaching your students Marxist interpretations of Song history. You probably do it already, but you teach real Marxist interpretations <laughs> of Song history. I don't know. But people, uh, it's uh, since the beginning of this course, and it's not our course's fault, there's been a palpable tightening of this. Our president, Drew Gilpin Faust, will be speaking at Tsinghua University next Tuesday, March, on March 17th, on March March 17th, 17th, about the role of universities in solving society's problems and on the role of universities in particular in dealing with climate change. Uh, but my guess is that she will also address this issue, and yeah. we shall, mm -hmm. and you shall, perhaps, if yeah. you're at Tsinghua, see what she says. Yeah. You know, I, I think we, it's very easy for us here in America to forget that 50 years ago, 60 years ago in this country, there was also a tremendous amount of political pressure brought on universities 
to stop teaching left-wing ideas. That's right. right. And universities did not resist very strongly. No, so right? some did more um, than some others. Some did more than others, but I think this tension between political authority and its politics and universities and intellectuals is not something unique to China. True, but in the Eisenhower administration, there was not, as I recall, a Republican Party secretary for Harvard University. No, there wasn't, but there were lots of pressures brought to bear on I Harvard know. University, and people did lose their job. Right. Hmm. I, it's absolutely true. So how were the National People's Congress's delegates selected? Um, somebody said they look a bit old. They look to be over 60. <laughs> uh, now, I'm all yeah. in favor of people who are over 60 <laughs> having right. having power, I have to tell you. But, yeah, but no, I... Um, not that they have power. You know, it's very interesting. Actually, they're not as old as some of their predecessor bodies, either for Kuomintang or, mm. or Chinese Communist Party. Uh, so according to the, to the rules, there are five central and local levels of people's congresses in China out of the National People's Consultative Conference. You may not know this, Peter, but all citizens of the People's Republic of China who have reached the age of 18 have the right to vote and to stand for election regardless of ethnic background, race, sex, occupation, family background, religious belief, education level, property status, or length of residence. That's unless very good. Been, unless you've been deprived of your political rights. Mm. Uh, who actually serves in the National People's Congress is Ling Wai Jinshui. It's something a little bit different. Uh, it's chosen in a highly complex way, really from top down. We have to be fair. Mm -hmm. It's selected and then elected. You have to be selected as a candidate, allowed to run, and then a slightly larger number, sometimes more at different levels, than the number of candidates ultimately seated will run for certain positions. Right. Uh, this it, is this is democratic centralism. It is democratic centralism, and it privileges institutions that the government wants to be represented in parliament. So, for example, urbanites are far far outweigh people from rural areas. Uh, try and find a farmer in the National People's Congress, uh, but also try and find one in the United States Congress. If Harvard University uh, were in China, we probably would have one representative in the National People's Congress. Wow. And the, there are instances I know of Chinese academic institutions uh, in which everyone votes for their national mm -hmm. uh, 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 their representative, their representative in the National Congress. And the one candidate used to, is normally the president uh -huh. or the party secretary. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. You get to well, vote yeah. as to that. The one really striking thing is, uh, and this is very much of a difference uh, since the time of President Jiang Zemin. Uh, among the 1,200 richest people in China, 200 of them, or one in seven, are delegates to the nation's parliament or, or to the advisory board or hmm. body. That is to say, National People's Congress or National People's Consultative Conference. So in the United States, people complain quite rightly that people buy elections because you, have, you raise so much money, you have all this yeah. advertising, and the voters are swayed. In China, you don't need to buy elections. Because if you are really rich, the chances are you'll be invited to parliament. Mm. It's a different system altogether. Somewhat different. Yes. Somewhat different. Sorry to be so okay. cynical. Uh -huh. um, but the last well, thing I'd know, say, 18 of the Chinese delegates have a net worth individually greater than the combined wealth of all 535 members of the U.S. Congress, the nine members of the Supreme Court, and all of President Obama's <laughs> cabinet. So we're talking, we're talking about some serious, some serious, some wealth serious money there. All right, other questions? The uh, last question I want to bring up is, is one where somebody asks, to what extent is China's future development dependent on higher education? And then they raise the following question. The emphasis today is on science, technology, engineering, medicine right. as, as areas of, of inquiry, to some extent at the expense of the humanities and liberal arts. Right. And is that okay? I mean, if you, if you really bias towards the science side, science and technology, can you do without the liberal arts and in, in the development of, uh, well, of I the think, country? You know, I think what we tried to show in our educational China module is the answer that Chinese leaders themselves believe is no. Uh, the leaders of China's great universities have reintroduced the liberal arts, That's reintroduced right. uh, mm -hmm. uh, the humanities. A place like Renmin University, for example, extraordinarily strong in humanities and social sciences 
uh, even though a place founded to be the Marxist university, yeah. the first one yeah. uh, in China. And Tsinghua University itself, a technology really sort of trying to be the MIT of China, has brought back social sciences. And social sciences and humanities, and its business school has one of the most outstanding uh, liberal arts curriculum in the country. Uh, so, in principle, the answer is that people in China believe very strongly, as we do here, that the humanities and the social sciences are essential for China's future. It's just that the political winds of these last months have led one to doubt the depth of that commitment at the higher yeah. political levels. I, you know, I, in, in some sense, I, I, I don't worry about that because the public is so large and their ability mm -hmm. to communicate is so great. Which modules from the past have been most useful in thinking about the present? Right. We got a bunch of different answers. Um, there's a word cloud that would suggest that it's all about entrepreneurship in China. If you look at it, it's huge. Yeah. Entrepreneurship is bigger. Not that huge. It's uh, big. No, it's big, but you know, word clouds. Manchu's oh. small. Entrepreneurship, big. Global empire to global economy, bigger than yeah. most things. Um, of course, it's it's logical that more recent modules yeah, may of be. Course. May be uh, but um, don't you shouldn't feel bad. I, I don't feel bad because I read people like Colin Eleven, who says the Manchus and the Qing in Greater China Today, which actually is yes. China and the world. Yep. Lucy Costas, uh, Lucy Costas, you've been with us, uh, written many times, Lucy, and we've always appreciated your comments. Indeed. Talking about a new national culture of the Song Dynasty, uh, from global empire to global economy in the Ming. Um, the importance of the Manchus and Qing, which our colleague Mark Elliott talked about. Yep. And even going back to Han, Qin, and the Warring States. There are all sorts of things that she's a been able to see and, and as, as relevant to thinking about China today. In some ways, that's why we do this course. Right. Julia, that Julia Xi talks about, it's very interesting. If China is to lead, we need to ask what makes a country to be a leader. Does China need to find a new ideology or a new structure of society? At this moment, uh, China, she says, is more of a follower than a leader. Uh, maybe Qin is an example for reform. Whoa. Whoa, whoa that's <laughs> strong. Um, <laughs> or, or, or Tang. Or Tang. The yeah. open, openness right. of Tang, yeah. relative openness of Tang. Right. But I think actually the, uh, the, the, from the Sung An, the development of private property, the idea of individual autonomy, individual response, moral responsibility, is actually a very important aspect of, of the foundation for China. Right. Max Wiesenfield, uh, talks about uh, China looking outward, uh, and in that sense, looks back to the Ming. Kristen MGH, Creating Modern China, um, part eight, the foundation for answering these questions, can China lead? And Rodney um, Educational, China is the future, and, and education, certainly, but that would be a lesson I think we'd learn from. Almost any period of Chinese history. Almost any period, but particularly from the Song An. Yes, I think. right. All right, well, now we ask this question, which I, and you gave as always, terrific answers, but even uh, more detailed and thoughtful answers this time than before. What is your vision of China in 2035? What will be China's greatest strengths? What will be China's greatest challenges? And what do you most wish for as you think of China's future? So there's big questions. Yeah. Um, well, what, what, are, what are some what, of our answers? Let, let's begin with um, Ruthian, uh, I think that China will be in crisis in 2034 Ooh. with an environment impossible to live in and an untenable level of social instability generated by the extreme gap between rich and poor, urban uh, and rural. Its greatest strength will be the wealth that it will have accumulated over the last 40 years. My. But its challenge will be the unsustainable model that that wealth was built on cheap Chinese labor. Africa, she says, not China, will be the world's manufacturer by then. And China will need to leverage its educational and technological superiority to be a leader in economic It's business. certainly true that, that uh, in China, cheap labor is not the future. That's right. right? And, and they know that too, and, and it's already happening. Absolutely, right. it's right. already yeah. happened, yeah. I think, in yeah. many, many industries. Jazz Fan 100 uh, talks about air quality environment, right? Yep. And the issue of political controls as well. And to quote, what really needs to change is the growth at all costs economic model, which is unsustainable. In South Korea and in Taiwan, environmental improvements followed on political liberalization. Right. Is, is, is that right? Uh, I mean, I, well, actually, uh, environmental debates were part 
of the process and struggle for political liberalization, particularly in Taiwan. It was a weapon used by the opposition, by the Dong Wai, the non-party members before the formal mm -hmm. legitimization of of mm -hmm. of, uh, of opposition parties in Taiwan. Uh, and it was a very powerful weapon. So this tells us that because uh, environmental degradation is such an issue in China today, and it, and it affects everybody's own health, yes. their personal health. Actually, we'll put up a map showing you um, just where the pollution is in China. You can take a look at it yourself. And we will and put up a link, I meant to say mm -hmm. this earlier, to that film that may not be so easily found elsewhere. Ah, yes, Under the Dome. Under the Dome. Right. Um, the, uh, I wish those 100 million people who watched that film would watch China X too. But could. Maybe they will. Um, but, but, it, but it suggests that as, as we look at, at China, because so many people brought up environment as an issue, that we might see in the environmental movement, in fact, we might read it as the beginning of, of fundamental political change as well. Right. We'll have to see. We, we, shall, we shall see. Doug Ma, um, what does Doug have to say? Doug says that in 20 years, China will have a developed infrastructure and a well-trained, well-educated workforce. There will be major environmental challenges, but these are the same challenges faced by the rest of the world, and we must hope with fingers crossed that they will prove to be scientifically manageable. Mm. However, he cites Yuha as pointing out that China has a love of revolution. <laughs> um, <coughs> he says, I'm not a historical determinist, but I think Yuha points correctly to the likelihood of major social disruption. Plainly, the party too is nervous of this, uh, and I believe their lack of legitimacy is a major problem. They cling, he says, to their embarrassingly outdated and defunct European ideology as well, a justification of the political blah, 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 you blah. Can, you, can, you can read the full, the full post yeah. online. Um, but he does say that China also has resources of social cohesion and civilization. He does. And he has, does. He's, he's, he uh, ends on a much right, more positive right. note. Jenny Haushan. Let's see. Jenny, um, thank you again for writing. Jenny says um, that China's greatest strength is, without doubt, its people. Not just the future innovators, environmentalists, scientists, artists, leaders. Ch uh, change, she says, is in all the people's hands. Also, the people making choices right now, what to value, what to fight for, yeah. what not to fight for, uh, what to walk away they, from. She also says the greatest challenge is the environment. Right. right? And that people, on the other hand, are also um, worried about division, instability, but we more attention needs to be given to the welfare of the individual. Right. So Tianlong says, my wish for China includes stability, pollution cleanup, social and political o openness, greater opportunities for all people, and social support for the marginalized. And you know, when I read that, I said, you know, that's also what the government hopes for. It is. And it's also it what intellectuals what it hope for. It is what it promises. And what intellectuals hope for. Um, I'm not sure that all the major industries hope for it. No. Because the major industries were some of the people, particularly state-owned industries, that mm -hmm. forced the suppression of Under the Dome. Uh, very likely. We don't, right. we don't, I know, don't know, sure. know that for sure. Okay. Chris J20M. Oh, wow. Oh, this, this is, is so great. great. He says, and he, so Chris J20M puts himself in China in 2035 and quotes presumably a newspaper report, quote, and all over the country, spontaneous outpourings of gratitude for the 82nd birthday of our great navigator, the glorious <laughs> President Xi Jinping, are expected from all loyal citizens in this, the 23rd year of his wise reign. So uh, this is a question. This is actually. No, this is it's very funny, and, and you very, should read it. It's very amusing. But, yeah. but, but Bill, um, do you. That's very unlikely, I think. Yeah, and why do you think it's unlikely? I think because you have, um, even in a country with great challenges in putting forward the rule of law, you have institutional constraints that it would be, if President Xi, which I do not think will happen, if he were to serve more than two terms, uh, which is the recent practice in the, in the PRC, then this would be a potentially profoundly destabilizing Mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, move, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no matter how wise right. he may right. be as great navigator. Yeah. Yeah. Chris J20M brings up another point, which is that there's sort of a cycle of debt-fueled infrastructure spending mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to promote growth. Worry that that's, that's China will repeat the yeah. Japanese mistakes of the 90s. Yeah. But he uh, also perhaps. hopes that China succeeds. 
Of course. That co economy balances, environment cleans, inequality disbalances out. We all hope that. Elik Namur, with a long post, uh, talks about historical moments of, of where there are great changes in the Treaty of Westphalia, the French Revolution, birth of the USA, end of the Chinese Empire, um, fall of the Ber Berlin Wall, and so on. Long post, but brings up various possibilities that China is already leading in uh, different sectors, but that this uh, front-runner role is perhaps a bit self-interested. And I think, if I understand this correctly, jurisprudence, immigration, space technology, arms development, international empowerment, in resolving regional crises, soft power, and so on, are all fields where China will need to intens intensify its efforts to reach out to the global audience as a leader. Right. And that is a good point. Um, what country, not is, enough to what build, country, to build is, what country is not self-interested, one must ask? That is true. So, but and, right. It's a very, very thoughtful post, and uh, I right. urge you all to look, look but, at but, it. But then she also s says at the end, or he says at the end, the, the cooler option for China is to build its own internal process of Chinese history reading mm -hmm. and open up the debate within different wings of society to evolve a system of pluralism. That's a, yes. Uh, Tong X. In 2015, Tong X is a 30-year-old Chinese. In 2035, uh, Tong X will be 50. Uh, and goes on to say that there are many more problems for Chinese society than this full course has mentioned. For example, the aging problem. And we haven't really we dealt haven't talked about with that. that. Uh, maybe in 20 years' time, uh, this will be one reason why so the society explodes more than anything else. And they will cause major problems in Shanghai, Beijing, the large cities. And he hopes that China X will survive. It in, will. Until that day. It will. <laughs> Whether we, we will not. We, we will not. But, but, uh, but the <coughs> next generation will. But remember, when you get to be 50, 50 by that point will be the new 30. <laughs> <laughs> PC Zhang. Uh, PC Zhang, you've been with us from the start. And uh, yes. you have another wonderful post. Uh, and we hope you'll all come back, by the way, when we do China X 2.0, because we expect to hear from you then as well. He brings up two issues. One is environmental challenges, which we've talked about it, but the other one, which mm -hmm. no one has talked about, is the problem of what he calls Han nationalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, if you could have African Americans, Chinese Americans, Tibetan, why not Tibetan Chinese, Uyghur Chinese, and so on? And I think, in principle, in China, there's the notion that all the different ethnic groups are Chinese. That's but right. perhaps there has been among the Han, among what we would traditionally call the Chinese, a greater stress on the Han ethnicity as rightfully Chinese mm -hmm. at the expense of others. And he talks about the different ways this actually can, can hurt China, this, this issue of, of Han nationalism. Um, read his post and see what you think. It's, it's, it's well worthwhile. So Bei Wei writes in, 20 years from now, my dream is of a China that is not only prosperous in a material way, but a society with attention for the well-being of all of its citizens, regardless of who they are, where they come from, and what they think, write or say. Is that possible? If it's somewhere possible, why not in China? Why not? Why not indeed? Right. P.S. Pragans. Two possibilities for China in 2035. A re repressive police state, he suggests, a la Stalinist USSR, uh, or a nascent democracy. Those are two rather different uh, <laughs> two, uh, possibilities, two different hoping for the latter, right. uh, worrying that it may be uh, the former. I, I doubt, I doubt the former. that it will be the former. Whether we get a nascent democracy or not or something else would be very interesting to see. Mm -hmm. Paul H.C. is the last comment we want to bring up today. Right. He hopes for a China that's a stronger partner with the U.S., but also a China that could inspire America in the areas of space, infrastructure, and green energy. He imagines in 2035 Chinese companies coming into America to fix our declining infrastructure. Huh? Come sooner. Right. <laughs> Come sooner, please. And then he, his final comment, and I think this is profoundly true and true for all of Chinese history, is the only thing that can stop China is, of course, China. And that's right. And I don't think it will. The Chinese, the people of China, ultimately make their own future. And that's always been true from the beginning of history. You know, we thought it'd be, uh, given that this is our last office hour, regular office hours, we thought it would be nice just to tell you what goes on here because 
We have uh, staff, Junjia and Tiffany and Megan, and they'll look at all the discussion forums, collect all the questions, and they give us pages and pages of your comments that they've chosen that we have to study and prepare for. They tell us what issues we have to tell you about in the questions. And we're sitting here with three cameras and a camera crew, and then tape goes to Ananda who edits it. It's a fairly elaborate process. Thank you all very much for joining us. We're going to have one last meeting with you, sort of the final sum up and reflection on the whole course in the past three, four, five thousand years of Chinese history. But uh, we look forward to seeing you all in China X 2.0. It's been an honor to be with you. Take care.